So we're going to be talking this morning on Joshua and Caleb, uh, more on Caleb than Joshua. Uh, and we're going to be in the book of uh, Joshua, chapter 14, to begin with. This Lent series, we're talking about things that we're giving up and kind of coming at a lot of maybe different words or concepts, uh, things that we're, we're willing to lay down or to give up. Uh, and we're using primarily people in Scripture. So we're jumping into people's lives and into biographies uh, to kind of look at different things that people lay down or hand over. And this one's been a really interesting uh, one for me this week, reflecting on and thinking about uh, Caleb. And we kind of pick up the end of the story in Joshua chapter 14. And so what has happened at this point is the Israelites who were brought out of Egypt, out of slavery in Egypt by Moses, uh, go into the desert. They find God there. They meet God. And God gives them his law. God gives them kind of his call, his direction, his promises for them. Um, and then eventually after a season where a whole generation has to die out before God's going to move them forward into the promised land, uh, that happens. And then Joshua, who's now going to be the leader of, of God's people, leads them into the land. And they're beginning to figure out which tribe, which of the different tribes of Israel are going to be in which parts of the land. And something interesting happens as they're dividing up the land uh, on the west bank of the Jordan. Uh, we get to chapter 14 here, and in verse 6 it says this, Now the men of Judah approached Joshua at Gilgal, and Caleb, son of Jephthuna, the Kenizzite, said to him, You know what the Lord said to Moses, the man of God at Kadesh Barnea, about you and me. I was 40 years old when Moses, the servant of the Lord, sent me from Kadesh Barnea to explore the land, and I brought him back a report according to my convictions. But my brothers who went up with me made the hearts of the people melt with fear. I, however, followed the Lord my God wholeheartedly. So on that day, Moses swore to me, the land on which your feet have walked will be, uh, will be your inheritance and that of your children forever, because you have followed the Lord my God wholeheartedly. Now then, just as the Lord promised, he has kept me alive for 45 years since the time that he said this to Moses, while Israel moved about in the desert. So here I am today, 85 years old, and I'm still as strong today as the day Moses sent me out. I'm just as vigorous to go out to battle now as I was then. Now give me this hill country that the Lord promised me that day. You yourself heard then that the uh, Anakites were there and their cities were large and fortified. But the Lord helping me, I will drive them out just as he said. And then Joshua blessed Caleb and gave him Hebron as his inheritance. Um, that's a crazy story. It's a, a whole life story wrapped up into two paragraphs, really. Um, and at the center of it is this idea of Caleb, a man of his convictions, and that those convictions led him to follow and to trust and to believe God wholeheartedly. And then it moves quickly to an 85-year-old man who is saying he's still as fervent, still as strong, still as passionate as he was in his youth. Um, and you have to, to picture an 85-year-old with a sword. And I don't think you're getting the idea that this is going to be Russell, uh, Russell Crowe and Gladiator or, or any other kind of war movie where you've got the, the perfect picture of a, a soldier or a warrior at the peak of his strength who can take on others in their youth, in their 20s and their 30s, and overcome them with physical strength. I don't think that's the picture of Caleb. 
I think it's a picture of an, of an old man whose heart is still incredibly passionate and whose vision is still incredibly clear and that that person is saying his strength is there because nothing has changed in his heart or his relationship with God or his faith or his belief or his trust or his convictions from the time he was 40 till the time he's 85. I find that an amazing picture. Now, if, if we turn back, I want to start where the story began. So if we go back to Numbers, Numbers chapter 13 is when the spies went into the land of Canaan. Moses sent out a representative group, and they go uh, and they spy out the land, and then they come back. So this is Numbers chapter 13. And starting in verse 26, it says this, Now they came back to Moses and Aaron and to the whole Israelite community at Kadesh in the desert of Paran. There they reported to them and to the whole assembly, and they showed them the fruit of the land. They gave Moses this account. We went into the land to which you sent us, and it does flow with milk and honey, and here is the fruit. But the people who live there are powerful, and the cities are fortified and very large. We even saw descendants of Anak there. The Amalekites live in the Negev, the Hittites, Jebusites, and Amorites live in the hill country, and the Canaanites live near the sea along the Jordan. Then Caleb silenced the people before Moses and said, We should go up and take possession of the land, for we can certainly do it. But the men who had gone up with him said, We can't attack those people. They are stronger than we are. And they spread uh, among the Israelites a bad report about the land that they had explored. And they said that the land we explored devours those living in it. And all the people we saw were of great size. So fear overcomes the people. The people rebel then because of the fear, listening to these reports. And so if you jump down to chapter um, 14, verse 24. We see this, in verse, 23, uh, in verse 23 we see the punishment that not one of them, not, not one of these people will ever see the land that I promised on oath to their forefathers. No one who has treated me with contempt will ever see it. So living in fear, distrusting that God is powerful enough to deliver on his promise is the same as treating God with contempt. Another way of saying treating something with contempt is that you treat it as little You treat it as small. You treat it as an object you're going to push away. So God became small. God became something that people needed to push away from their lives. They were going to treat it with contempt, not embrace it. We talk about um, the hiddenness of God when God is far or at arm's length. The interesting thing I think we see here is something that shows up in the Proverbs. In the book of Proverbs, it says a man's folly... A man's own folly ruins his life, yet his heart rages against the Lord. I think sometimes when we talk about the hiddenness of God, what we really see is that we've chosen to treat God with contempt, and we've pushed God down in a way, and then after a matter of weeks or months or years, we sit there and we feel sorry for ourselves and we wonder, why is God so far? Why will he not give me what I desire, what I ask for, or what I'm pleading him Uh, for. And this is what happens with these Israelites. They treat God with contempt. And then verse 24, it says this, but but because of my servant Caleb, but because Caleb has a different spirit and follows me wholeheartedly, I will bring him into the land we went to and his descendants will inherit it. And since the Amalekites and Canaanites are living in the valleys, Uh, turn back tomorrow and set out toward the desert along the route to the Red Sea. So God gives this judgment to the people, gives a quick word about Caleb. But Caleb, because he was wholehearted in his devotion to me, will see it. And then he moves on and says, now turn back to the desert. A couple other verses, Numbers 32, uh, 12. If you want to write these ones down, feel free. Numbers 32, 12 says this, Not one except Caleb 
the Kenazite and Joshua, son of Nun, uh, for they followed the Lord wholeheartedly. Not one will see the land except Caleb and Joshua, for they followed the Lord wholeheartedly. Deuteronomy 136, no one will see it except Caleb. He will see it, and I will give him and his descendants the land he set his foot on, because he followed the Lord wholeheartedly. Psalm 86.11 says this, Give me an undivided heart, O Lord, so I may praise you. I, I remember being back at Clemson when I first was reading through the scriptures. I came to that and I pondered it and wrote essays on it and I, came, I kept coming back to this psalm. Like, What does it mean to have an undivided heart? I think what we're hearing here is this idea that Caleb had an undivided heart. He wasn't seeing one set of things over here and God over here and, and trying to weigh them out and go, geez, how do I make these things work together? How do I create a cosmic win-win where I'm the architect of how it's all going to work? I'm the one who's, who's going to impose my will, understanding what God's will is and kind of what I see over here that seems to make sense or looks desirable, and I'm going to try and mesh these two into one really good life plan. That's a divided heart. Caleb didn't have a divided heart. So he was wholehearted in his devotion to God. He saw only God's will. He saw only a big God that he wanted near in his life. He knew only that to keep God near and to serve a really big God, it meant that he had to live by faith, that it wasn't his eyes that saw big people or scary things or, or the numbers not being on his side, but he saw only God and knew only yes and knew only kind of passion and conviction that whatever God says to do is the right thing to do. Whatever God says to do is what I want to do. Wherever God is going to go is where I'm going to be found. That this is, this is where Caleb was, not trying to kind of orchestrate or mesh or, or lace these things together. I kind of get what you're saying, God, but what if we revise that to include this? What if we revise it to take some of the scary elements out? What if we just tiptoe around the edges? What if we just go make peace with those people and we still get to the land, but we do it on, on kind of different terms? What, what if, what if, what if, what if? And Caleb was wholehearted. Now there's something interesting here. Um, Caleb is, is given this wonderful promise that he'll get to see the land. But what that means is that from the time he said yes to God, he was going to walk around in the desert, toiling in the desert, um, going nowhere for 40 years of his life. Some would say the best years of his life. Or 45, actually, I think is what he said. So 45 years from the time he's 40 till he's 85, this wonderful promise of God, Caleb, I got good news for you. You're going to see the land. It, it, what that actually means is, Caleb, you get to walk around for 45 years, watching everyone die, doing nothing, going nowhere, accomplishing nothing, building nothing, growing nothing, um, and then when everyone you know dies, guess what? you get to see the promised land. And I started asking myself this week, how would we take that life plan that God just gave to Caleb? How would we see that? I started thinking about it by generations. I don't mean to like stereotype, you know, I can always talk about my own generation. No one gets mad at me. Whenever I talk about someone else's generation, it seems like everyone gets mad at me. Um, but if we take just the dominant stereotypes for you Gen Xers, 45 years of building nothing, accumulating nothing, growing no generational wealth or no legacy that you'd be able to pull, uh, pass on. Um, 
And that, I mean, I'm talking for the best years of your life, the dominant part of your life, um, up until the last couple of years before you die. Gen Xers, that's, that's your plan. That's God's will for your life if we're going to put you in this story. Are you okay with that? Can you be wholehearted with that? Can you be joyful about that? Can you get excited about that? I'm sorry, uh, boomers. I'm talking about boomers. Um, Gen Xers, that's me. Um, this story is not about you. You know, you don't even get a book of the Bible named after you. Um, you get to go into the land, uh, but you're going to still have to fight your way in, and then you're going to die. But, but before that, you're going to spend the bulk of your life, the biggest part of your life, in a, in a prison. You're going to be trapped in the desert. You're not going to get to experience pleasure. You're not going to get the fruit of the vine. You're not going to be drinking um, the good wines or eating the good food. Um, it's not really going to feel like it's about you. It's not going to be comfortable. You're not going to love the experience. That's God's will for your life if you're a Gen Xer, if you're putting yourself in this story. Are you okay with that? Can you be wholehearted with God and say, okay, that's okay? Can you treat it as a blessing? Can you stay faithful? Or after a year or two, are you going to look to, to get out of that somehow and go, there's got to be a better way. I'm going to sneak out of the desert. I got some long lost relatives in Egypt. Um, I'm, I'm going to go somewhere else where I can be back in control of my life and make sure that when I come to die, I didn't waste all these years. God is going to waste my life in the desert. You millennials or Gen Y slash millennials, I don't know. Um, how does this feel? Um, you're not going to get to share it with anyone. No, I'm, I'm, dead ser I'm, I'm dead serious. When you get to go into the land, you've lived your whole life for this. This has been your, your vision, your goal, your dream, that you'd be able to walk into the land, take possession of this land, and kind of put roots down for you and your tribe. But by the time you get there, all of the people you respected are dead. Yeah, there's younger people, right? But not your people. Not the people whose opinions you really cared about. You don't get to take a picture as you're going into the land and share it with people. No one's going to see it or like it. No one's going to know. You don't even get the camaraderie of, of those people that were your peers that you lived most of your life with being there at your table when you, when you celebrate the first feast in that land. You're going to be alone in, in many respects, alone. I, you watch those movies, um, that uh, wonderful, wonderful, well-made drama um, I can't even remember the name of it, and I'm joking because it's not a drama, but it's Captain America. Remember, like, he gets frozen, and then he wakes up, and, like, his whole generation has moved, has, has come and gone? And you're, like, in this movie um, watching it, and you're thinking, that would be so trippy. The movie Interstellar that just came out with Matthew McConaughey, right? Like, he goes and all of a sudden when he, you know, something happens with the black hole or whatever it is and then when he comes out, his own daughter is like an old woman. And you're like, oh, that's so trippy. Like, I don't know how good pleasure would be if I can't share pleasure with the people that matter to me. My generation, my people. And so here's Caleb. It's like, you're going to get blessed from God He's got a will for your life. This is what it is. 45 years in the desert. And then when you go into the land, a couple years before you die, like you're doing it as, as really the only one of your generation or one of very, very few. How, how much 
does that sound like a life that we're willing to embrace? I think it raises a tension for us about God's will. I feel like lately, last six months or a year, even two years, almost everyone I talk to were, were and even myself, we're in this existential crisis about God and God's will and God's acting in our life. I think there's a, a huge existential crisis going on um, because we're all experiencing, a lot of us, pain or suffering or difficulty or trials. And, and when that happens, we begin to look up and go, God, where are you in this? How can this be happening if you're truly on duty or you're watching or if you care about me? If you love me, God, how could this be happening? And it, and it creates that whole problem of pain, the problem of evil in our lives. Um, I've never written on it, never talked about it. It's not in a single Redux video, but turn with me to Exodus. I might write on this because it's a fascinating thing I've been chewing on. Uh, Exodus chapter 33. Exodus chapter 33, this is uh, Moses and God. This is the story of Moses and kind of that relationship. And we see this interesting thing. Um, and God promises that his presence will go with Moses uh, and the people, and that I will give them rest. And then Moses says in verse 15, so Exodus 33, verse 15, if your presence does not go with us, do not send us up from here. How will anyone know that you are pleased with me uh, and that your people, that you are pleased with me and with your people unless you go with us? What else will distinguish me and your people from all the other people on the face of the earth? And the Lord says to Moses, I will do the very thing you have asked because I am pleased with you and I know you by name. Then Moses said, now show me your glory. So there's this big thing. It shows up in the book of Hebrews that Moses is the one who saw God face to face or that God, the, the one that encountered God um, directly. But listen to the next verse, verse 19. It, um, Moses says, now show me your glory, verse 19. And the Lord said, I will, call, uh, I will cause all my goodness to pass in front of you. And I will proclaim my name, the Lord, in your presence. Moses says, show me your glory. Meaning, come out from wherever you are. Let me see, let me experience who you are. Show me your glory. God says, I will cause my goodness to pass in front of you. Think about that for a second. Moses says, show me, God doesn't say, here I am. Um, God doesn't say, here's my arm, here's my foot, here's my, my head, whatever it is, um, turn yourself about. He says, um, here comes all my goodness, it's going to pass in front of you. What I've been chewing on with this is it's a, it's a really fascinating thing that to God, his presence the reality of God, um, the manifestation of God, the closeness or intimacy with God is indistinguishable from goodness. God is good. To see God is to see goodness. If you're going to catch a glimpse of God, you're going to catch a glimpse of goodness. And so I think what happens is, is when we don't see goodness in our life, I think we know this deep down. This is, this is in our hard wiring. We're, we're the children of the Most High. We understand this somehow. And so when we are looking at life and we don't see goodness, we therefore conclude what? God isn't here. God must be far. I'm alone. I'm, I'm alone with all of this, and it's too much for me to carry. Look at the other way we can see this. Jeremiah, if you turn to the book of Jeremiah, 
chapter 12 of Jeremiah. Jeremiah chapter 12, Jeremiah is after Isaiah, and we get Jeremiah making a complaint to God. And this is how chapter 12 begins. He says this, you are always righteous, O Lord, when I bring a case before you. You're you're always righteous. Yet I would speak with you about your justice. Why does the way of the wicked prosper? Why do all the faithless live at ease? You have planted them and they have taken root. They grow and bear fruit and he continues on. It's a really interesting thing. When we see goodness, another way of saying that is justice because another way of saying justice is when things are the way they ought to be. Goodness. Shalom. Okay? When we see goodness, it's natural for us to see God in it. To see the connection When we don't see goodness, when we don't see justice, when we don't see things the way they ought to be, when we don't see shalom, it's natural for us to question God. That that happens in us without us even thinking. That's the way we're wired. We see it here with Jeremiah. We see it with Job. All these things are happening to me. I know that I'm righteous. It says in the book of Job that Job was righteous. Without blame. He knows that he's a righteous guy, yet all these things are happening. And his friends' answers are like, no, you're not really answering what's going on. And so Job presses and he presses and he presses. And he's like, God, I would bring my case before you. Because something's not right. It's not just. It's not fair. And so he presses and he presses for this audience with God to say, it doesn't make sense. It ought to be good or it ought to be fair. You ought to be in the mix of it and that's not how it is. And so God finally grants him audience. He comes before God. He presses his case. He brings these charges. Look at my life. Look at the pain, the trial, the suffering that shouldn't really be like that. And, and so now give me an answer. And God shows up. God talks, God talks, God talks, God talks, God talks, God talks. God talks. Never once does he answer the question that Job was asking. God finishes talking. Job says, I'm answered. I'm answered. And you read the book of Job and you're like, how were you answered? God didn't explain the why of your suffering. But what God did do was he showed up. The presence of God met Job, reminded Job that yes, he knows what's going on. Yes, he's bigger than everything else. Yes, he's in control and that that should be enough. And Job saw the goodness of God, even if he didn't see the blessing in his life. And he said, that's where I'll anchor my trust. I'm answered. The fact that I know you're there and that you've got all of this, okay. Caleb, looking at God, I don't have to have reasons for all of it. I don't have to see how it's all going to work out. I don't have to see how it makes sense. I'm not going to see with my eyes. The fact that I know you're there, that you have this, that you have the power and the ability to kind of make good, all of that, that's good enough for me, God. I'm answered. 45 years in the desert, okay. That's my test of faith. I'm answered. There's this really interesting thing about the will of God. Um, we think that the will of God for us should lead to more and more and more blessing. But nowhere, nowhere in Scripture does it say that. Even Psalm 23, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, it doesn't say God is going to always get me out of the, the valleys of the shadow of death and that more and more as I go around the landmines, my life will get better and better, my bottom line will go up and up. Nowhere does it say that. It says, though I have to walk through the trial or the desert or the valley of the shadow of death, um, I will not fear because you are with me. And so there's this really interesting picture where I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to frame myself to the circumstance 
and then take my joy and, and get my strength and my security from the fact that I'm not alone, the presence of God, knowing that God is good despite the challenges I'm facing and that I'm going to anchor here in faith as I walk through this very difficult trial. I think as I explore my own um, American heart, and I don't mean to say that in an anti-American way, um, I once talked about immigration and had some dear people that I loved leave the church because they said I was anti-American. So I'm, I want to be careful, I'm not anti-American ever, um, but I'm an American. And so I, it doesn't, it's not hard for me to critique America because all I got to do is look in my own heart and see what I find there and know, you know what? Um, we do this. This is what I do, and you just you can tell me if this is what you do too. But when I begin, uh, begin to get dragged through the valley of the shadow of death or pulled into the desert, I kick and scream. I kick and, I kick and scream. Am I the only one? I kick and scream because something's wrong. This is not how it's supposed to be. This isn't what I envisioned for my life. This isn't what I saw coming. This isn't what I would have chosen. This isn't what I trusted God to do for me. I trusted God to lead me better. And now I'm experiencing pain or difficulty or, or suffering. And in the midst of this, my heart is pounding and something's broke and it needs to fix and it, need to, it needs to fix now because too much longer of this and my, my whole life might be ruined. You ever, you ever grapple with my whole life might be ruined? I think we grapple with this all the time. Um... The, the enemy that you're facing that's going to ruin your reputation. My whole life is going to be ruined. Um, the lack of a job or the financial challenges you're facing that you're looking at, and it scares you to death. My whole life is hanging in the balance. In other words, the life I envisioned the way I saw this going, my kid going off the deep end, becoming someone I didn't want them to become, I see where it's going, and if that happens, all of my dreams for what life was going to look like for me as a grandparent with my kids, my extended family, it, it might be ruined. And so as we begin to go through these challenges, we kick and we scream, and that's natural, but there's a point to where we have to say, if this is your will, God, I will trust in you. I will face these and I'll begin to walk through it trusting in you, looking to you for your presence or a degree of comfort that I know you know and that you are with me and I'll continue to go through that. The phrase wait on the Lord is, is something that's rich that's through all of scripture. Wait on the Lord. Wait on the Lord. If I were to sit down and write a, a, a book for a God right now, I'm going to sit down and write a book. This is the book that's going to tell you about the God of the universe. I wouldn't put the phrase, wait on the Lord, in there. Would you? It wouldn't come to my mind. He's big. He's powerful. This is what he's going to do. It's what you should do. Um, wait on the Lord is a phrase that God put in the Bible. When God speaks and you get those, thus saith the Lord, God says, those who wait on the Lord, or no one has seen any other God who takes care of those who wait on him. This is a phrase that God put in Scripture for us because this is the way it's going to work. And so our experience begins to show us that, that we have to wait on the Lord that we have to be patient and persevere, that it's foggy, that walking by faith means I don't know how it's going to all resolve. I don't even know where it's going. I don't even know anything, yet I trust. I'll walk by faith. I mean, picture it. Close your eyes and, and picture groping. That's what faith looks like. And there's a whole lot of ways I can open up my eyes and try and figure my way out of it apart from what I know that God has told me to do or revealed to me how I should live. But he says, no, in the midst of the worst of the worst that might ruin your life, you still trust. 
You hold your convictions and you trust wholeheartedly. How does that happen? It means you have to be willing to lay down your expectations. You have to be willing to lay down your dreams and your expectations and say, God, all of it is in your hands. And now I'll follow you. You don't get to hold on to any, I will follow God, but this has to be a part of my life picture. You don't get to do that. We don't get, I don't get to do that. And so if you really got alone and we're really praying with God and we really realize what this means to live wholeheartedly, it means that we have to take all of life and be willing to, to give it to God, not knowing where it's going to go and knowing that for, for, for some of it, it might not go the way we thought. Now that creates a huge crisis or moment of faith. Am I really, am I really willing to trust God with all of it? Because if I do that, I know everything changes. It might change for the better, but I don't know that. I can't guarantee that. I can't control that. I know God is a good God, but if I give him everything, I lose control. Can I really do that? In my book, I, uh, I'm just going to read this interesting thing about, I think, that comes up with suffering. Um, I take on this phrase... I always remember hearing this growing up that um, your suffering is this, um, that God wants to build character, not comfort. Remember in your suffering and your trial, God wants to build character, not comfort. It's one of those Christian sayings that you nod along with before you even finish hearing it because it sounds so obviously spiritual, right? But the idea that suffering exists to bring me character rather than comfort, is flawed as it still articulates a self-centered way of understanding the reality of daily life. Even the suffering and resultant character is ultimately focused on me and about me. I'm still the hero of the story and the suffering only makes sense if it helps me to grow. If it has a purpose of, of serving my interests, then suffering's okay. The desert served no purpose for Caleb. Do you understand that? It served no purpose. It's not about Caleb. Caleb didn't make it about Caleb. God's will is his plan and his purpose. And what we do is we say, God has to have a will for me, a specific will for me, like a mission impossible for me. And if I was really honest, that means that if he's going to have one for me, he should have one for all of you and all seven billion other people in the world. Like all these different wills for every unique indiv individual. And, and if everyone's will is going to be so amazing, it's like, how does that even work? Rather, I think God's will is, is big enough that it can include 7 billion people. God is going to lead his people into the promised land. And through those people, through, through the... Uh, the, the nation of Israel that came from Abraham, he's going to reveal himself and his future Messiah and bring blessing to the world and bring all people back to himself. He's going to show us love and grace ultimately through his plan that he's doing that includes moving all of these folk out of the desert and into that land. Where does Caleb fit in that? By the way, Caleb, because you trusted me, come to the front of the line. I want you to see this and you and I get to share this even if all your friends are dead. You and I get to see this and we get to rejoice in this and we get to be together in this as you realize that my will is something you get to take part in. Why does God allow suffering in your life? I don't know. What I do know is that God's will is big enough for you to serve it with your life. I know that your DNA and genetics are making your body different than you'd hoped it would be as you grew older. I know that um, a lot of us are really struggling financially or with jobs. I know that people aren't treating you the way that you wish they would. I know that you're really afraid of, of the future because there's some really scary realities, the kind that keep you up at night 
and give you ulcers. I know that. That's the messiness of life. But I know that in that mess, we can find the joy of the Lord as we seek to serve his will with our life. And that when we're willing to do that wholeheartedly, it might not look like what we dreamed of, but instead of kicking and screaming for 45 years because not everything is going my way, I get to walk with the Lord and maybe just maybe love a few people along the way and make the world a better place and know the joy of, of being the kind of person, even in my trials, that God would have me be. When I gave Tamara a ring, I had to sell all my baseball cards to give Tamara a ring. And if I'm honest, I'd tell you I still had to take money from my dad. Tamara's not here, I can say that. Um, but so, sold all my baseball cards. I had to bring her a ring. She really, I think she really liked the ring. Um, when I'm giving her the ring, it's easy for her to say, um, isn't this great? I'm on board with this. Um, if I were to be in a wheelchair, if I were to be dying, if I were to lose my mind, if I were to be something else, and I'm giving her something different, her true commitment to me would be shown by her saying, even when this is what you're bringing to me, I'm still committed to you. I still love you. This is still where I'm going to take my life and go with things. Does that make sense? It's easy for us to jump up and down and sing Chris Tomlin songs when God is blessing everything you touch. But when everything is going to hell and you say, I still choose you, God. I'm still going to trust you with my life. This pain is real, and I know you know it's real, but I'm going to still follow this thing through. That's commitment. That's worship. So, in conclusion, are you willing to lay down your expectations? Are you willing to drop what's in your hands and believe that there's something bigger for you to hold on to? Are you really willing to believe the gospel, the good news that says the joy of the Lord can be your strength? That it's not anything that you would go after or design or fashion um, that that would be your strength, your ultimate comfort or security, but it's the joy of the Lord, the presence of the Lord, that God is good even in the midst of your pains, that like Job, when you understand that, that you can follow him. Um, is how we deal with our suffering something we're, we're willing to make a part of our worship? What you're going through today, your insecurities, your fears, how you're seeing the future, how you're seeing other people. Are you willing, instead of kicking and screaming, to look and to say, God, I offer this to you as my act of worship. Of course I want it to go away. Of course I'd rather you take this out of my hands and put something better in my hands. But I'm going to follow you regardless. This is my act of worship. It's you not your blessings that I worship. And that's, that's the question for me. Is, are we really willing to take God on God's terms or to have God serve our terms? Father, I pray for myself and my little shred of belief, my little shred of faith, that you would take it, that you might grow it, help my unbelief, Lord. I pray for all of us as a church that's having to go through this grand transition as the church in America is changing so radically, and we're beginning to realize that we can't be holding on to notions of theology or scripture that aren't necessarily true, that were cultural, that were handed on to us as a, a kind of a cultural, syncretistic form of faith or Christian belief. 
And as we're going through all this, we're beginning to realize that some of that was wrong, is wrong, and that has to, to shed. And that in its place, we have to, to hold on to truth and follow you in truth and understand that your will and us serving it is at the heart of Scripture. Rather than us deriving our own will or vision and then always putting you in the servant role to our own ends. That's got to change, Father, and it's hard for me. I know it's hard for all of us. I pray that you would gently walk with us as we try to find you truly. Thank you for sending your son, that as we continue to stumble, there is grace and grace and grace upon grace. We love you. In Jesus' name, amen.